Hello, everyone. We are live on Facebook. We're so glad that you are joining us today to have a conversation with Aria Green. Um, we are thrilled to be uh, having this unique virtual um, experience on, on Facebook, to have this experience for Israel programming. We're really thankful to the many, many people that are have made this possible today. So I want to in, invite onto this stream um, Pam Albert, who is the uh, um, among the many, many hats that she wears. Um, she is one of the uh, co-chairs of the Holy Blossom Temple uh, Israel Engagement Committee. Hello, Pam. She is also um, with the uh, friend, Canadian Friends of Jaffa uh, Institute. And Pam, I want, I'm going to ask you to just unmute. Um, and there you are. So welcome, Pam. And I'd just love for you to say a few words about who has made this uh, this morning possible. Sure. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank our sponsors for stepping up to help us make this unique, out-of-the-box, exciting event a reality. The One Family Fun Cross Israel Hike, Stand With Us Canada, the Canadian Anti-Semitism Education Foundation, and the Canadian Friends of the Jaffa Institute. I am honored to have the opportunity to introduce the One Family Fund Cross Israel Hike for this incredible organization actually began as a volunteer initiative called Adopt a Family at Holy Blossom Temple 18 years ago. Today, One Family is Israel's number one organization helping victims of terror. One fam Family's annual signature Canadian event is a cross Israel hike. Many who have joined the hike, including many Holy Blossom members, will tell you that it is one of the most inspirational experiences of their lives. Inspiring the next generation of leaders for Israel, Stand With Us Canada educates and empowers student leaders on university campuses, teens and high schools, and members of the community across the country to support Israel and fight anti-Semitism. Anti they believe that education is the road to peace. The Canadian Anti-Semitism Education Foundation has been educating Canadians about the rise of anti-Semitism for 20 years, particularly the most subtle anti-Zionist version. It is actively educating people about and promoting the adoption by all levels of government and the International Holocaust Remember Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism and its principles. And last but not least, the Canadian Friends of the Jaffa Institute's mission is to eliminate the intergenerational cycle of poverty in Israel by providing the resources that empower children and their families to become contributing members of society and to provide care and support to our Holocaust survivors. Our current focus is providing meals for families, seniors, and Holocaust survivors living in Jaffa, South Tel Aviv, and surrounding areas. Now let the journey begin. So thank you so much, Pam. We're very grateful to you for all that you do uh, for Israel and for our Holy Blossom community. And I'm so thrilled to also welcome to the stream Arie Green, uh, who also wears many hats. Um, Arie is uh, the chief strategy officer at Gigawatt Global, an Israeli company developing renewable energy projects in Africa. He is the author of My Israel Trail, Finding Peace in a Promised Land, about his hike on the 700-mile Israel National Trail and overcoming personal challenges and serves on the board of Jerusalem's Ma'alei Film School, the only Jewish film school in the world. Welcome, Arie. Arie has also Thank been you. a policy advisor to Natan Sharansky and a business executive and consultant for the past three decades. He continues to be active promoting freedom and democracy in the Middle East and supporting Israel's public diplomacy, including serving as a briefing officer in the IDS Spokesman's Unit he was a co-founder and director of Media Central, a Jerusalem-based project of honest reporting, 
providing services for foreign media in Israel for over a decade. Arie was born uh, in Washington, D.C., and is a descendant of one of the very first Jewish families in North America, arriving in 1690. Arie grew up in San Francisco and went to UC Berkeley and has lived in Israel for uh, well over 30 years now. He holds a bachelor's degree in psychology from UC Berkeley and a master's in international relations from Hebrew University, as well as a master's in business management from Boston University and Ben Gurion University. In 2015, Arie married Miriam and they live in Beit Shemesh. Beit Shemesh. Uh, between them, they have nine children. And aside from hiking all over Israel, and as we're gonna hear him speak about that today, uh, when he's not promoting his renewable energy and accuracy in the media, Arie also grows grapes and makes his own wine. So hopefully we'll get to uh, <laughs> see some of that as well. Are those, are those the vines right behind you? They are indeed. You can see at least some of the uh, some of the 21 vines that I have in my backyard in our home vineyard just behind me as the sun sets. Wonderful. So Arie, we know that we are really looking forward to um, hosting you here in Toronto. We know that was initially the the plan, but we are so thrilled that we were able to be with you <laughs> virtually, and uh, it's actually wonderful to be able to be here with you in your home. Um, so thank you very much for uh, for being here with us today, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Rabbi. I really appreciate, Rabbi Zachary, your, your invitation and, and having me today, and of course, I want to thank uh, Pam Albert, who was instrumental. Pam, you and I have been working on this. Well, your invitation came maybe two years ago to try and figure out some way to get me to Toronto. And I'm so sorry I can't be there with you in person, but I'm really delighted that we found a way to make this happen, not only just to make it happen as a, as a Zoom event, but I'm really happy to be out here in the sun in, in Beit Shemesh, the, the house of the almost rising sun in loose translation, the house of the, of the sun in the middle of Israel. Um, especially because, as we said, we wanted to talk about the kind of the, the feeling of the land of Israel as we prepare for our, our Yom Atzmud, our Israel Independence Day celebrations. Uh, and of course, I want to ask all of the, the co-sponsors, of course, you there at Holy Blossom Temple uh, and the Canadian Anti-Semitism Educational Foundation, as well as Stand With Us uh, and One Family and their Cross Israel hike, which of course, uh, speaks directly to my heart, but we'll we'll come back to uh, to our, our co-sponsors uh, towards the end because there's actually a connection I think between all of us and all of you um, within the context of uh, looking at some of the issues that I want to discuss today. So, as Rabbi Zachary, thank you for handing the the baton to me, as it were. Um, I want to start with kind of a little bit of an exercise in imagination, and then. Uh, as you'll see, we'll, we'll spend the next maybe 30 or 40 minutes talking about some of the, the ways where hiking the land of Israel uh, on the Israel Trail, as I did, um, aside from the lessons that I learned to, to help me meet uh, the personal challenges that I was facing, but how hiking the land of Israel can reconnect, can help to reconnect us with the story of our people and our country, uh, our nation, um, our history, our culture, and our shared and joint identity. So thank you for being with us, all of you, for, for joining us today. Uh, and let's get started, as it were. I, I want you to imagine for a second that I'm on uh, the side of a cliff. And being on the side of the cliff means that I was a cliff. In fact, this very cliff that you can see on your screen, um, I was hiking up the, the, uh, the path that you see in front of you. And I kept going. And all of a sudden, it came to a stop. Now, I had a fall of about maybe 40 feet to the rocks below on my right, and I had a cliff on the left side, and I had a 50-pound pack on my back. I basically panicked because I couldn't go any further. I couldn't turn around. On the one hand, the, pack, the weight of the pack would have uh, pulled me down to the rocks below. On the other hand, I, the pack would have hit the side of the, uh, of the cliff. Um, and I would have lost my balance also. So thank goodness for, for Thomas Crum. I took three deep breaths, a book that he wrote that I had read maybe a year previously. I took three deep breaths and I tried to calm myself down and I slowly lowered my pack to the ground. And in doing so, 
uh, I basically managed to gingerly turn around and retrace my steps back to where uh, I found where the path went up the side of the cliff, where I had just missed the path sign. Well, I got back to my pack and I put it back on and surprisingly enough, it felt lighter somehow. And the point is that nothing had changed in the pack, of course. What had changed was my attitude, it was my sense of confidence. I knew where the path was. I had found the, the signs for the trail and therefore I knew what direction I needed to, to walk in. And I think to a certain extent, that's a, a metaphor. Sometimes we have to put our baggage down as it were, not just our backpack. But we have to put our baggage aside and we have to, to evaluate where we are and where we're going and, and take a look with a, a slightly different perspective on some of the, the reality that we're facing and the, and the, the, the truths that we, that we take for granted as it were. As you can see from some of these pictures, I, I basically hiked a thousand kilometers, 700 miles uh, over the course of eight weeks along the Israel National Trail all alone. Uh, and I did so, uh, as I mentioned, with a 50 pound pack on my back. I did it uh, as a result of a, a very difficult situation that I was facing in my personal life where uh, we had just finalized my former wife and me, our divorce, uh, which was a very, very difficult period over the course of three years leading up to that. And uh, I just got out to be out, to, to walk the land, to reconnect with our history, with, with my sense of identity, to have a little time, of course, on my own. And it really gave me a perspective, a, a whole different transformative perspective, uh, not only in terms of uh, learning lessons that helped me to deal with the, the challenges I was facing, but uh, it gave me a whole different perspective on our shared history, of our connection to our land, of our, our identity as a people and my place within the context of, uh, well, let's call it reawakening uh, Zionism. To a certain extent, that's what our discussion today is about a returning to basis, a putting aside the baggage of how do we defend Israel on college campus and in the media and in the political realm and amongst our friends and, and, and that putting aside our labels of left and right and conservative and liberal and religious or orthodox or conservative or reform or even Jewish or Christian or otherwise. And we're turning to the basics where let's start with this understanding. Just a week ago or a week and a half ago, we celebrated for eight days the holiday of Passover course of Pesach. And that holiday was one in which we, to a certain extent, re-established or reasserted our identity as a people. Because remember, the exodus from Egypt was a national event, not a religious event. We celebrate the exodus of, uh, from Egypt as basically the first step we took, not as a family, as a tribe, as a clan, but actually in the formation of uh, our nation as a people. And having celebrated that, the connection that you can imagine to three days from now celebrating uh, Yom Ma'ut, our modern expression of that same independence, that liberty, that freedom that we gained in the exodus from Egypt, expressing it today in, in celebrating Israel Independence Day, again, reasserting not just our sovereignty and connection with the land, but our identity uh, as a people. Now, Rabbi Zachary, if you'll play that video uh, that I know that we discussed earlier, uh, you have here, I, I want you to walk with me to a certain extent. This is a video of my walking uh, at one point in the Negev desert. And I'm sharing it with you primarily to, to try and invigorate our sense of connection to the land. And throughout our talk today, I'm going to show, as you've already seen, some pictures uh, and some videos of, the, uh, of the, the trek itself. And in this case, as a beginning, I just want to take a quiet moment to appreciate the silence of the desert. And yes, I was purposely silent there, and I'm hoping that you could hear even the birds in the background here in my garden in Beit Shemesh. That silence is something that means so much to us as a people, and that desert is something that we connect with so incredibly within the context of the, 
the wandering of the children of Israel, children of Israel, our family, as it were, one family being one of the sponsors of our talk with their cross Israel hike, expresses that concept that yes, we're a people and we're a nation, but that nation started as a family. And that family, that clan, that tribe, that people wandered through the desert for 40 years. And you might imagine that for me, wandering the desert for the first three weeks of my trek through the Israel Trail was a powerful connection. It wasn't just a transformative experience of silence and, uh, and, and physical challenge and aloneness. But I would say every day, if not every step, I was seriously aware of how similar this, this was to our forefathers, to our ancestors, wandering through the desert to reach their promised land. So basically what I'm looking to do here today as we look at, share some of these anecdotes and some of these, these pictures and videos is to put our baggage down as it were, to rekindle our love affair with, uh, with Israel, the land, the nation, our shared people, our shared history and shared destiny. The truth is that I was overwhelmed with challenges as I was walking through the, the hike that I took. I meditated on mountaintops. I cried in dry creek beds. I wrote anguished journal entries at night. I composed songs to lift my spirits. I looked back and inward. I looked down to the ground, watched the beetles leading me to a certain extent and up to the night sky. I looked back along the trail to see how far I'd come. And what I discovered on the Shvil, which is the Hebrew name for the trail, Shvil Yisrael, what I discovered on the, sh on the Shvil was a sense of self, a, a sense of personal and national history and a perspective of sorts on the human condition and on an hour our sense of identity as a people and our connection to the land. And my book focuses on the trek itself um, and the personal story of the lessons that I learned that helped me in the process of healing. Uh, and I'll mention some of them in passing in our discussion today, but uh, the truth is that's not our focus. Our focus here is much more to, as I said, put our baggage down, not have the arguments about politics and about how to defend Israel so much as rekindling our love affair with Israel by reevaluating the somewhat stale approach taken uh, over the last number of years, which is basically what I did while walking the land of Israel for the eight weeks that I did. You know, the truth is that our Parsha, our Torah portion, uh, reflects this as well. And, and I want to start with that not only because Holy Blossom as a synagogue is, is co-hosting uh, our event today, but I think it's appropriate as we move from Passover, Pesach, to uh, the holiday and the celebration religiously and nationally of Yom Atzmaut, of Israel Independence Day. Our, one of the Parshas that we're reading this week, uh, Kedoshim, uh, along with uh, Achrei Mot, talks specifically where uh, 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 God says, Daber el kol adat b'nei Israel, Kedoshim tihiyu, speak to all of the assembly, of all the community, of the children of Israel. Those two words in our Parsha, one of the first times, and one of the most significant times that God addresses us, not only as B'nai Israel, as a family, as the children of Israel, the children of Jacob, but as an Edah, as an assembly, as a community. And later in the Parsha, later in the Parsha, in the portion, there's a reference to uh, not uh, holding grudges against whom? Against lo tatur et B'nai Amecha. Don't hold a grudge against the children or the sons of your people. Again, the word am, people, being used in the course of the exodus of Egypt as the first time as the, the family and the tribe of Israel, the clan, was molded into the nation of Israel. Our Parsha uh, is then uh, continues with the, the very well-known phrase, Vehavta lerecha kamocha, which to a certain extent, connects our national identity as a people and as a family, love your neighbor as yourself, that the members of our community are re'echa, are your brothers, are your kin. And the commandment, the moral imperative to behave towards one another with dignity, with love, with compassion, 
then connects our national identity with a sense of national mission, of morality, of mitzvot, and this primary fundamental mitzvah that's in our parsha. So I wanted to also bring that into our discussion about rekindling Zionism, because what is Zionism? We often talk about it in such kind of uh, uh, esoteric terms, and we don't really remind ourselves where it comes from. What does it really mean? Zion, the, 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 the hill, uh, which is the, the center of our people's identity, Jerusalem, Zionism being what Abba even called, and I quote, nothing more and nothing less than the Jewish people's sense of origin and destination in the land linked eternally with its name. This idea here you can see in the video, the Hula Valley, and in a second, uh, we'll have the enjoyment of watching me cross the screen just to show a little bit of what it was like walking the land of Israel with a 50 pound pack. There we are. Abba even summed up what was basically an ubiquitous understanding of what Zionism was and what Jewish peoplehood is. But it's something that we often don't refer to in all of our advocacy work. And it's true with the wonderful work that Stand With Us does, also the Canadian uh, Anti-Semitism Educational Foundation, the Jaffa Institute, which I apologize I didn't mention earlier, of course, with its uh, social work in, uh, uh, and efforts in, in Israel, uh, in Jaffa and elsewhere for, um, for uh, the needy, um, and Holy Blossom with the Israel Committee, uh, as well as, of course, One Family and its activities. We're, we're all very connected with, with a sense of identity and a sense of purpose in our advocacy work. Um, but we don't often use the language that Abba even used, which was to a certain extent in his generation, not just ubiquitous, but understood. I want to connect this also with something else. I use the term uh, uh, national as opposed to religious with regard to how we celebrate Yom Atzmut, how we celebrate Pesach. Um, but we have a concept where instead of, uh, of using the words Zionism or legitimacy, which is, of course are both very important, um, I believe that we should be returning to the language that was used a hundred years ago in documents like the Balfour Declaration. Uh, and in the, the mandate given to Great Britain, uh, which, which refers to a national home for the Jewish people, which refers to Israel and the land of Israel as our ancestral homeland, an understanding, and this is not a political concept, an understanding that we, in fact, are the indigenous people of this land. That's not a political statement. That is not suggesting that there are not discussions that needed to be had about others who are resident in these areas. And it certainly also came, uh, came about, was part of the mandate given to Great Britain uh, when they were instructed to foment the uh, establishment of a national home for the Jewish people, not to do anything that would uh, prejudice the rights, the civil rights uh, and religious rights of, of others in the areas. So we're not talking about whether or not it's a reasonable thing to discuss the creation of another Arab state in this region in whatever borders might, might uh, exist. What we're talking about is reasserting the legitimacy of Israel and Zionism, of reasserting using language that 100 years ago was ubiquitously understood and today has to a certain extent been lost in all the political arguments that we have between left and right and orthodox and reform uh, and liberal and conservative and uh, American or Canadian and Israeli and the like. I wanna bring our attention. I actually just took a note, made a note this morning because some of you may know that today is actually the exact date a hundred years ago. This is the centenary and we could be and should be celebrating it. We didn't advertise this within the context of the San Remo Treaty, but the San Remo Treaty, which is an instrument of international law, was signed and brought into force today, April 26th, 1920, which was the first time that the international community gave legal expression to what they all basically had in any case understood and acknowledged and recognized, whether it was politically or historically, geographically or otherwise over the previous 20, 30, 40 years. What do I mean? When you think about it, there were recognitions of the reality that there is a connection between the Jewish people and the land of Israel, which is to say the people of Israel with the land of Israel. There was recognition of that reality in the time of Napoleon, 
It was a recognition of that reality by the international community uh, throughout the ages. Think for a second of Migilat Esther. We just celebrated Purim uh, about five, six weeks ago. And we read in the Megillah of Esther, where Haman says to King Ahasuerus, there is this people. In other words, there was a definition and understanding that, that the Jews were a people, not just a religious entity. And we read in the Haggadah about how we have a mitzvah to consider ourselves as if we came out of Egypt as a people, not as a, a religious community. We have a situation where anthropologists and sociologists Geologists over the last number of generations have argued whether, in addition to the five recognized civilizations in, uh, in humanity's history, whether the Jewish civilization, Judaism not as a religion, but the people of Israel as a civilization with its own language, its own connection to a land, its, uh, its own culture, um, its own legal system and what have you should be recognized as a civilization. This all relates to our identity as a people, which, as I said, was ubiquitously understood and, and, and appreciated by the world community, which is why the Balfour Declaration recognizes that, which is why coming back to uh, the U.S. Congress did too at the time, as well, of course, as the, the mandate given to, to Great Britain. But the San Remo Treaty explicitly says, and I quote, Whereas recognition has been given to the historical connection of the Jewish people in Palestine, which was the name for the land of Israel at the time, and to the grounds for reconstituting their national home there. I, it's important, I, I, you can't stress enough the wording that they used, ancestral home, national, natu, national home, reconstituting, which is recognizing that we once had sovereignty there, sovereignty there, that we have a historical connection and we do so as a people, not as a religious connection to a particular place of, of worship. In other words, this was the first time that it was a legal and political entity that was created called Palestine at the time, connecting a recognition of the Jewish people, recognizing the Jewish people who were explicitly described as the beneficiaries of the, the trust given to the mandatory power to Great Britain at the time. It basically put into effect the Balfour Declaration in binding international law. You can't overstate the importance of this. It was the, the first time that the de jure, de jure legal concept of sovereignty was vested in the Jewish people, even though that was delayed, of course, until 1948. Why am I making such an important, uh, stressing this so, so importantly? Primarily because we often hear about how this is a territorial conflict. And again, I'm not getting into politics. Reasonable people can disagree as to whether or not those who self-identify as Palestinian Arabs should or shouldn't be given an independent state. And reasonable people can disagree where that state might uh, be established, perhaps in the 70% of the land of the original mandatory Palestine, which was geared to creating a national home for the Jewish people, which was given against the terms of that mandate to the Hashemites as a consolation prize for not giving them uh, the Hejaz, uh, where Mecca is, um, and then created a, an Arab state there called Jordan. That's possible, but it's also possible that in the ancient Jewish people of Israel's lands of Judea and Samaria, that reasonable people can discuss the, the idea that those who self-identify as Palestinian may have some claim to an independent uh, entity or state there too. The purpose of my stressing these issues is not to create a political debate between those on the right or those on the left who will or won't advocate the idea of the creation of the Palestinian state. And it has nothing to do with the Trump plan, and it has nothing to do with President Obama, and nothing to do with Prime Minister Trudeau. We're not talking politics here. In the lead up to Yom Ha'atzmaut, what's so important for us to do is to reassert the legitimacy of the claim of the connection that the people of Israel have to the land of Israel. And that's why I took time to, to focus on that here in our discussion, because that reasserting is not political because you can reassert that connection that the people of Israel has with the land of Israel and decide that in the, in the interest of peace that you believe that it's right to advocate the relinquishing of that claim in the favor of another claim. Reasonable people can debate the opposite too. That's not the point here. As we gear up to celebrate 
Israel's independence, what's important is that we include, that we, that we bring in and, and that we help others to understand a focus on the connection that we have. What do I mean by that? I mean, focusing that, uh, on the idea of Israel as a people, the Jews as a people, and not necessarily as religion. I mean, focusing on the ideas of, of Klal Yisrael, of Am Yisrael, of the Mamlacha, of the, 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 the Jewish peoplehood that Abba Ibn and others, of course, have, have uh, uh, referred to over the years. I mean, also the idea that Zionism is the national liberation movement of the Jewish people. And I mean, the, the use of terms like Israel as our ancestral homeland, which it is, and the Jews as the indigenous people to Judea, the people of Israel as the indigenous people to the land of Israel, to help strengthen our position irrespective of what political arguments we end up having. I basically am, am relating this from a number of different standpoints because it's still relevant. And if Rabbi Zak, if you'll show that, that photograph of the Roman road uh, that I took when I was hiking on the trail, bringing us back to walking the land and with a few more pictures and, and videos. Um, I want to relate to it specifically because when, when I was hiking up the trail in the hills of Jerusalem, not so far from here, um, uh, I came across a path that I hadn't yet discovered. And what you can see here behind me are steps that were built into the hills of Jerusalem leading up to the, the, the capital Jerusalem, what they ended up renaming as uh, Elia Capitolina to try and uh, divorce any connection between the people of Israel with the land of Israel. Um, and they did this in order to help their carts and mules to ascend uh, the mountains to get up to Jerusalem. And you can see I'm smirking there and I'm smirking there because I basically was feeling that this is part of the Israel trail and I'm hiking it and I was feeling, you know what? Where are the Romans now? We're back. We're still here. We actually never left here. Our connection to this land is, uh, is so strong and so continuous. And where are the Romans today? And the reason I'm mentioning that, the reason I wanted to throw in that picture here too, because this is not just history. I want to share with you what some of you may know. I think Stand With Us has been active uh, as well as the, the UAEF as well uh, um, as others in noting that just recently the Danish Bible Society redacted the word Israel from the Hebrew Bible, what they call the Old Testament, just recently. This is news from literally less than a week ago, as if today's Israel is not connected to that biblical reality. They even explained it by saying they did this because they didn't want to confuse people. But you understand how, uh, how injurious this is to any understanding of the reality. By making that separation, they are actually delegitimizing the reality, delegitimizing the establishment of Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people in the land of Israel by disconnecting it with the biblical Hebrews, with the biblical Israelites. It's not just ancient history. It's the view today that Israel is somehow illegitimate. And that's something that we have to continue to strive to, strive to, uh, to overcome. So what do I mean? And what is that? Why is it important today? I think, you know, Jonathan Sachs, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs once said that, I wanted to quote it correctly, I think I have it here somewhere, but uh, he said that we are a religion and a people of argument. You go back to the Gemara, the Talmud, the Mishnah, uh, the, the medieval commentators, and even up till today, obviously, not just between Reform, Conservative, Orthodox, or others, um, left, right, and what have you. We, we are a nation of arguers. But today, what's so important, and one of the reasons why I'm so proud that the co-sponsors of our event today to reawaken our Zionism come from all walks uh, of, uh, of political advocacy and of religious observance. Um, today, what's important, Rabbi Sachs said, and of course, uh, I think we can all agree, is, is a unity, a unity of purpose and a unity of understanding of the legitimacy of Israel and the, and the legitimacy of Zionism, even while we continue with our internal debates over particular policy issues. So what's really important, how do we reawake Zionism? I want to share with you my definition of Zionism. And uh, I'll, I'm going to close relatively uh, soon. So in fact, Rabbi um, 
Zachary, if, if you want to show up a few more of those photos um, while, while I uh, continue, then we can get to some, some Q&A. I want to get to a bit of tachlis. Tachlis meaning, what, so what should all this mean? Very nice, Ari, you showed us some nice pictures and you've given us some, some food for thought. Um, but I, I define Zionism in a very particular way. If Zionism in the first 50 years of the 20th century was focused on creating the, promoting the development of and the creation of the idea of a national home for the Jewish people, a sovereign state uh, for the people of Israel in the land of Israel that we now call Medinat Yisrael, the state of Israel. And if the second 50 years of the 20th century was focused on building up that state, of helping it to create the institutions, uh, not just Sahal, the army, but the the, uh, the financial, educational, business, medical, and other institutions to make that state successful. And supporting that effort was our Zionism of the latter half of the 20th century. Zionism in the 21st century, I think, can be defined in a very, very specific way. And that is defending and supporting the right of that nation state of the Jewish people to exist, to exist and to defend itself. And that means that we have to make our voice heard with a certain semblance of unity, even while we argue over specific policy issues. You know, Mark Twain once said, if you don't read the newspaper, you are uninformed. And if you do read the newspaper, you are misinformed. And that's a big problem we have in the media and groups like Stand With Us uh, and, uh, and the Canadian uh, Foundation for uh, for education uh, and anti-Semitism work to help to promote a better understanding and a more accurate understanding of Israel as did the organization that I led for 10 years, Media Central. And of course the Israeli government does uh, as well as well as many other organizations. But aside from the media, we have to do the same with our political leadership, with uh, the academic community on college campuses, with church leaders and, and business leaders and labor leaders. We need to, to not let the, the, I'll call them lies, pass. What do I mean? I mean the inaccurate depiction of the reality that we know on the ground in Israel. Because words count, terminology counts. We can't allow political leaders to talk about a cycle of violence. We can't allow them to equivocate between an attacker and a, and a victim. We can't allow the media or politicians to use words like youth, when really we're looking at and talking about a, a, an act of assault. These people who are making attacks on innocent civilians should be called assailants or terrorists. And the same is true when a quote unquote settler is attacked. These are Jews, these are Israelis, these are people. It's important not to delegitimize them by the use of terminology, which is, which is delegitimizing. Uh, the truth is there's many, many, there are many other terms that, that I could get to also. Occupation, the idea of the word settlement as opposed to village or community, the idea that those settlements are prima facie illegal when in fact you can disagree with whether or not they should or shouldn't be built or, or established or supported, but they're certainly not prima facie illegal in the national law. What's most important is that we take action. All of us. We talk about reawakening Zionism and, and celebrating Israel Independence Day, putting a flag up and, and, and saying Hallel or prayers uh, to celebrate the establishment of the state of Israel after 2000 years of dispersal. Yes, it's a miracle and we need to celebrate it, but we need to take action as well. It's time really to stand up. And that's why I love the name of one of our co, co sponsors, Stand With Us. It's time to stand up and be counted. Because it's not, as, as Rabbi Sachs said, it's a time to band together. It's not a question of left or right or Democrat or Republican in America or conservative or liberal in, in Canada, not even Israeli or American or Reformed conservative Orthodox or, or Christian or, or otherwise. It's important. It's time for us to have this sense of pride and a sense of unity, even while we disagree on some policy issues. It's a simple question of, of moral clarity. And it's kind of funny because, as you know, one of our co-sponsors is called One Family. And that's one of the main themes of, uh, of the thoughts that I'm sharing with you. We are one family. And as I was walking the, 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 the trail, in fact, I, I don't know if you showed the, 
the video of the of the wheat fields yet, Rabbi Zach. Um, but uh, certainly you could show that in those last three photos uh, before the final one. Um, I just want to conclude and, and open for questions and answers the few kind of thoughts about uh, this issue of, of us as a, as a family, uh, as a one family and how we need to stand together. Because walking, walking in nature, in the land of my people, where our prophets and our forefathers lived, where they worked, where they fought and died, and where they introduced the ethical monotheism uh, of Jewish thought and tradition to the world. At a time of re-established independence here, this all for me, and you can see me walking there in the wheat fields near Gimzo, not so far from here, from Beit Shemesh. For me, all of that was, was as a friend described it, it, was just one long meditation, as it were. It combined my love uh, for the outdoors with a deep emotional identification with the Zionist enterprise. Uh, and, and it combined that with a powerful aim that I had to enhance and improve my spiritual and my religious practice and commitment. I learned so many lessons about appreciation of the blessings that are in my life. And that includes and included uh, the, the privilege I have of living in Israel and this wonderful experience, this miracle of our reestablished sovereignty. Uh, here in the land of Israel after 2,000 years. It, I learned a sense of humility of, of my place in the world and a perspective even on my own suffering and pain and, and, and challenges as difficult as they were. Um, and I learned uh, a, a sense of gratitude and, uh, and also acceptance and acceptance of the reality that we face and how we have to work, uh, work to, to improve it. Um, and I, I learned a great sense of forgiveness, something that we can learn, uh, I think, as a nation, not only as, as, a, as individuals. I had to learn to forgive God for putting me in the situation I found myself, and to forgive my former wife for the decision that she took, which was not my choice and which turned my world upside down. Uh, but we have to learn to forgive the Arab world for attacking and killing and maiming us over the years and for their refusal to accept our our legitimacy, and to a certain extent, the Arab world has to forgive us for our insistence on our return to our ancestral homeland and our insistence on defending ourselves. Um, I also learned, the, the, the last lesson I learned was a sense of, of purpose, how important it is, as Viktor Frankl wrote in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, how important it is to have a goal. And that's true not only for ourselves as individuals. I mean, I had a goal. I had a goal every day to, to get to the night camp, to get to where I where I had put my water to wait for me. And I had a goal, of course, to finish hiking the, the entirety of Israel Trail. And my goal was to get my life back on track after my divorce. Um, but we have also, of course, a wonderful, a plethora of national goals as a people, both the nation state of Israel here in Israel, but also as a people, the people of Israel and the Jewish people. We have uh, all sorts of goals that, that we have always shared, not least to, to make the world a better place. Uh, to, to bring this concept of ethical monotheism to, to the world and, and, and be a light unto the nations. Um, but it's an important thing that I think the Arab and Muslim world also uh, will need at one point to develop to share, that, that their goal can't be just to destroy Israel. And for those who are not haters, the goal can't be just to establish another Arab state. One would hope that within their culture and society, their goal can also be to make the world a better place, to provide benefits for their own civilians and what have you. And those lessons, those five lessons, humility, uh, acceptance, gratitude, uh, forgiveness, and this uh, importance of having a sense of purpose to bring meaning to our lives, those were the lessons that I learned hiking uh, the, the Israel Trail. And without question, I, I was able to recommit to my own personal and national sense of mission and meaning uh, in being part, as I said, of this miracle of Jewish sovereignty returning to the land of Israel after 2,000 years. And I, sometimes we just have to set aside our, uh, our baggage and reevaluate. And that's kind of what I've tried to do today. Uh, and I hope I've been successful in helping you uh, get a little bit of a taste for the land if you have been and recognize some of the sites uh, for the experience that I had in hiking the Israel Trail. If you haven't been to Israel, if you have been, I hope you'll come again soon when uh, this corona situation of COVID-19 
uh, is finally behind us uh, or manageable. If you haven't visited, I certainly invite you to, to come visit, consider even coming to live here. Uh, the idea of exploring that idea of coming to live here or at least coming to visit is something that, of course, uh, I hope that will be part of your own understanding of, of your connection to our people and our land, our history and our, our shared destiny. And aside from that, if you do, uh, whether you read the book, My Israel Trail or not, I would be delighted to invite you to join me in my garden, to drink some of my homemade wine, to view the, the view of the Sorek Valley, which you can't see from here, but you can from my balcony upstairs where we can sip some of my homemade wine together. Uh, I'd like to conclude with the video of my arriving home uh, after the thousand kilometers where I arrived home uh, to be met by uh, two out of my three children. And uh, if uh, Rabbi Zach, you can put the video on, um, there's, uh, there's a little bit of fun there that gives us a little bit of a sense of closure within the context of having this sense of, uh, of pride and of, of coming home, as it were, um, together. And this is, uh, I literally walked home at the end of the trail instead of uh, oh we have the sound too right that's wonderful so she dropped me off here and she was like i would have come to the house but he was like well, let's to go <laughs> <laughs> she was like he was like waiting there you can see i carried a little guitar with me <laughs> <laughs> the last half of the journey oh, so i can see the little guitar there with me the last half of the journey hey from molina hey she's coming <laughs> What is this? You go through it! No, 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 wait, wait, I'm coming around, I'm coming around, wait, wait. <laughs> Dad, you have to run through. Wait, wait, wait. I see you smiling, Rabbi Zach. I, I, I hope you enjoyed that. I, I would like to think that all of us might have some similar feelings of exhilaration um, when we think about coming home to Israel, whether it's to, to make Aliyah or to come visit. And the connection that we have, as I said, with our shared history, our shared destiny, our shared sense of values and, uh, and sense of peoplehood and that we are indeed all one family, that we should stand together, whether in Jaffa or elsewhere in supporting the people of Israel, uh, that we all can enjoy the holy blossoms that we have in Israel and there in Toronto uh, and help to, to fight anti-Semitism and using educational activities together. How is that? I think I got everything together. Holy blossoms. You got it all together. All right. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, we uh, hope to take you up on your offer to try some of your homemade wine. Um, it would be a, a lovely day to do so today. And um, thank you so, so much. Um, I'll put in a, just a word. I know that uh, Holy Blossom is looking forward to coming to Israel soon and, uh, and reconnecting with the land, as you put it, and walking and living in the experience of the land and of the people. Uh, so we have a, a trip journeying through Jaffa. Um, so for more information, you Wonderful. can uh, reach out to myself or to Pam Albert, um, again, as our co-sponsor of the Israel Engagement Committee. At this time, I'm going to actually ask all of our sponsors to join us on the screen. Um, and perhaps uh, they have some questions for you. I know uh, we can start the, the Q&A session. There was a question. Hello, Andrea and Pam and Randy and Toby. Wonderful for you to be with us. Um, Indeed. Unmute us all. There you are. Hello. And we'll begin with the question that was posed um, on our Facebook page. Uh, this a question from Vicki Weiss. Uh, R.A., what was your biggest obstacle uh, while you were hiking the trail? Um, I, think, I think probably the best and easiest answer to that, Vicki, is uh, the the heat um, and the, the, the length of each day where I hiked maybe 12 to 15 miles a day. And it was not something that I was necessarily used to. I did this at age 51. 
I, the, the usual cohort that hikes the Israel Trail in Israel are, are post-army 21-year-olds um, who I, I saw a few of them on the trail. Um, but it was, it was a real physical challenge with this. Uh, did I mention that I was carrying a 50-pound pack on my back um, at age 51? And it was, I, I had done day hikes all, uh, all my life growing up in California and living in Israel for 35 years, taking my kids out on Tulian maybe one or two night overnights in backpacks. But, but uh, the, the physical challenge was difficult. But I guess the other aspect of that would be the, the loneliness. Um, although uh, I, I very quickly came to an understanding that there's a very big difference between being alone uh, and being lonely. And because of the situation I found myself in, I was looking for time alone. And as I mentioned, I have a friend who called it just one long meditation, this whole uh, eight week uh, trek. Um, but that was probably the other of my main challenges. When I wrote my book, I, I looked into my journal entries and I, I was surprised to see that I actually hiked. I hiked the whole thing alone, but that doesn't mean I didn't see people off and on, you know, here and there in the course of any given day hiking along the trail. People coming towards me or, or passing me often because they were younger. But there were 12 days in the course of the, the 48 days that I hiked, 12 full days where I didn't see a single soul from morning till night. Um, and that was also, I think, part of the challenge and uh, part of uh, the pride that I have and, and, and the healing nature of the, uh, of the walk itself was the time that I spent alone um, with my own thoughts, contemplating, reflecting, uh, and, and learning those lessons that I described so briefly. Beautiful. So I'll just uh, make a comment to anyone following along uh, on the live stream that if you have any questions for REA, please do... Uh, type them out in the comments section of our Facebook Live, and we can uh, ask those questions for you. Um, and at this time, I'll, I'd love to uh, open it up to our, our uh, sponsors. Um, and if you have any questions, I'll just ask that you introduce yourself, say which organization you're from, and uh, go ahead and, and uh, the floor is yours. Okay, I have a question. So with my Love of Israel, Arye, thank you for helping me connect so deeply in my heart with the land and the people of Israel. And there's the walking for me and what I learned from that. And then all the things that everybody does, all the great things. And I was wondering if there's anything that we as an audience um, could take away from you today that will help us in these challenging times moving forward. So I, it really resonated for me when you said you didn't know which way to move forward and you had this heavy pack. And when you figured it out, you help, you found lightness. So how can we all find the lightness above the fray and meaning to move forward? Um, well, I appreciate the question, Pam. And I think that, that one of the main things that I learned uh, on the hike, and, and I haven't talked a lot about the people I met uh, from all walks of life, old and young, Israelis and, uh, and, and non-Israelis, Jews and non-Jews, including Druze and Bedouin Arabs and others, um, uh, all of whom encouraged me greatly uh, in the course of, uh, of the hike. One of the takeaways that I had was, was, I don't mean to be trite, it sounds so trite to use this phrase, but there's that wonderful book and movie, The, the Incredible Lightness of Being. Um, and there's no question that when I talk in the book and when I mentioned here briefly this issue of humility, um, it was one of the first lessons that I, that I learned and you saw in that little taste of walking through the desert. Um, I really did get a perspective of sorts on, on my problems and getting a perspective on the challenges, the suffering, the pain that, that I had been going through, um, it, it could have been... Um, overwhelming it could have been disturbing or, or depressing but it wasn't it was it was strangely liberating and i think that that translates into an understanding that we i think should have and i don't mean to to try and teach wisdom to to others we all have our own experiences and our own understanding but when you think about the arguments that we have there in canada in the states here in israel political arguments religious arguments we are so focused on defending our standpoint and one of the things that i really did discover on the trail was a little bit more of that 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 sense of inner peace uh i mean just i remember walking through the judean desert 
one day, one of the days where I saw not a single soul for the entire day. And all of a sudden feeling at one, I know this sounds like real hyperbole, so I'm feeling at one with the universe. And I suddenly understood why our prophets uh, escaped to the, to the desert, it seems, to, to get such inspiration, why, why the Torah was given in the desert on Mount Sinai, why uh, Eliyahu heard the still small voice uh, that he did um, in the, in the, the context of a, of a very quiet kind of mountaintop after, of course, the, the storms and the thunder and the, uh, and the like. I think, Pam, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that, that, yes, we continue to argue, of course we will, on all policy issues, domestic, foreign, Israeli, Canadian, what have you, American. Um, but we should at least take a step back uh, and I try to do this in the context of, of course, the, the third election, perhaps fourth election season that we're uh, experiencing here in Israel, um, that we do all disagree on a number of very important issues. But at base, at base, we actually agree on a lot more than we disagree. And that's a lesson that I took away from the, from the trail, uh, primarily because of the experiences I had and, and the people I met on it. Thank you, Arya. Please. Um, I'd like to, uh, first of all, thank you for having woven so many amazing themes together. And uh, I love the way you built the organization names and I wish that I could, well, maybe it's recorded and we can use it. Um, but you point out several things that I think we ought to be working on and, and, and maybe you can comment on. It. The education of Jewish and non-Jewish kids does not include the history that you're talking about. For example, the average Jew doesn't know about the San Remo Declaration, and I'm so glad you mentioned it because today is important, and we have a full day's programming on Zoom that people can um, continue. <laughs> yes, I saw that. But, yeah, but they, and it's because that is so fundamental to understanding the establishment of Israel. One of the other things I heard recently was that um, it's in the teaching of the public uh, school kids, whatever uh, race, religion, whatever. They don't learn that there's a Jewish contribution, a Jewish people. It's not about differentiating religions and saying, you know, there's Christians, Muslims, Jews. It's about the Jewish contribution to the development of the world and to each country. Can you comment on whether you think that's something we can actually promote or other so ideas I, about education? I, I appreciate the question and I, I really do agree. Um, I think, Rabbi Zach, you mentioned a little bit of my family history, um, and I just wanted to reiterate, I, I grew up in a Reform Jewish family in California, on the East Coast, Washington, D.C., and then California, with a very strong American identity. I'm, I'm the direct descendant of the first American-born rabbi. And he was known as the Patriot Rabbi, Gershom and Desatius, the rabbi of the Spanish and Portuguese Jew synagogue in New York, Sheriff Israel. And when the British were encroaching on New York, I'm sharing this with you Canadian uh, subjects of the, uh, uh, of, of the crown, as it were, of the Commonwealth. And um, when the British were encroaching on, on New York, Rabbi Gershom Mendesius preached a ferociously pro-revolution uh, sermon and literally took this Sifre Torah, took the scrolls of the Torah and led his congregation out of New York, locked the doors of the synagogue, went to Connecticut, refusing to live under British rule. I grew up with that story. He actually was then invited to be, and he was one of the 13 clergymen who inaugurated President George Washington. I realize most of you are Canadian, so maybe that means less. But in fact, another branch of our family who married into the, the, the Seychelles clan uh, came to Montreal in 1690, one of the first Jews to come to North America. And I'm a direct descendant of these, these literally these, these uh, uh, um, uh, first Americans to a certain extent, although I suppose I shouldn't use that particular phrase, but the, the, the first Westerners to come to, to Canada. Um, why am I sharing that with you? Because I grew up with a very, very strong American identity connected to a very, very strong Jewish identity. Now, in my family circle, by the time I was born and the family was, was not as observant as they were 200 years ago, um, the idea of Judaism as a religion had taken very, very strong hold. And the, uh, the issue of the liberal streams of Judaism 100 years ago opposing Zionism uh, was something that was very strong in my family too. It's a battle that I have 
helped to fight, I have been very active in when I was working with Natan Sharansky as the Minister for Diaspora Affairs and the Minister of Jerusalem. We were instrumental in, in inserting into the curriculum in Israel as well as in Jewish schools abroad. Um, a lot of those issues that I was referring to here today and Andrea that you referred to, the fact that we are a people, it's a fact. It's not, it's not an argument and that's one of the things that we as Jews, let alone the non-Jewish world ha have lost. I mentioned that 100 years ago, it was ubiquitously understood that Jews were a people. H how is that expressed? Well, in one way, it's expressed in anti-Semitism. In other words, not just Haman 2,000, two and a half thousand years ago, but anti-Semites of the last century, century and a half, two centuries said those Jews, they're different. And that wasn't a religious statement. There's religious anti-Semitism, of course, as you well know. But, but it was also expressed in so many different ways. I mentioned Napoleon, and we already mentioned the mandate in the San Remo conference, which specifically talks about Jewish peoplehood. And we don't teach that enough. And we must, and why must we? Because that's what unifies us. Because first we were a family who became a clan, who became a tribe, who became a nation, and we retain that national affiliation and, and identity, which is why the state of Israel, the nation state of the Jewish people, sent planes to bring Jews from Yemen and sent planes to bring Jews from Ethiopia and welcomed a million Jews from the Soviet Union, some of whom weren't even halakhically, in fact, a third of whom weren't halakhically, according to Jewish law, considered to be Jews. They were descendants of a grandfather, a father's father, who were not considered uh, within Jewish law to be Jewish, but we embraced them because that's our self-definition. I think that, that there's no question that's something that we all, not just you, the sponsoring organizations and synagogues, but all of us need to reinforce with our children, with our parents, with our, with our peers. And that's something that I really have tried to do in my writings and, and in our discussion today as well. Thank you. There, but you spoke about words, and I think it's terribly important that we identify that there really are word crimes today as people have asserted many of the words that we need to use and use them against us. One of those words is Zionism, which has come to mean poison among the many of the youth. Can you talk about how that can be also, I don't know, reintroduced, uh, made more meaningful for this generation? You described sort of definitions of Zionism, and I totally agree with what you're saying. And as a consequence, I think certainly among many progressives, the word Zionism is is a hateful. They don't like it. Um, you so may be Ari, I just want to American... quickly frame this yes. because we're going to run a little uh, short on time. So um, it's a big question that we could probably spend another hour on. So I really appreciate the question. Um, so to the best of your ability to speak to this uh, regal achad, um, very complex. In 30 seconds. Well, <laughs> you can take more than 30 seconds, but uh, I'd love to address uh, another right. question or two as well. Absolutely. Well, I, I can say very briefly that I think that we have a few models of how the progressive community and the conservative community, how the Orthodox and Reform and non-observant Jews together, as well as non-Jews, can basically reclaim the word Zionism. I mean, that's what we have to do. We have to take back the, the understanding that Zionism is, in fact, the national liberation movement of the Jewish people. It's not a dirty word. Um, and one of the ways to do that, of course, is to not uh, ever accept any even hint that there's anything uh, even remotely related to racism or apartheid, which are words I don't even use in the same sentence uh, as, uh, as a word to describe what the, the Jewish sovereignty and the return to our sovereignty in our ancestral homeland is. Um, and so it is a matter of both standing up and, and I would say assertively, but not aggressively assertively going on the offensive and taking back the word Zionism, like the movement in America called Zionists does. You, don't, you, you can support or disagree with a lot of their policy initiatives, but the idea that we will, as progressives, as promoters of, of gay rights and of human rights and of minority rights, and even those who promote the idea of a Palestinian state, how we recognize that Zionism is, as I've even said, nothing more, nothing less than the expression of our return to sovereignty in our international homeland. That's why I, I keep returning to the other terms that I used, ancestral homeland, indigenous people, uh, a nation state of the, of the Jewish people, national liberation movement, the national movement of the Jews, which is Zionism. So yes, we, we need to take that back and we need to encourage even those who are opposed to specific Israeli policies 
to understand the legitimacy of Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people, which has nothing to do with Judaism or, or not only focused on Judaism as a religion. Is that short enough, Rabbi Zach? Thank you. Um, are there other questions from our, our sponsors before we uh, wrap up? Please, Randy. Uh, I just wanted to thank Arye for his talk, his very informative talk. Um, uh, Stand With Us Canada, we believe that education is the road to peace and that the facts speak for themselves. And that's why we educate Jewish and non-Jewish students about the facts of Jewish history, Judaism's uh, many millennia connection to the land of Israel, the birthplace of our culture. And um, I just wanted to um, reinforce that the idea that Arya raised about Judaism being only a religion is a very important talking point for extremists who bash Israel and Jews. And it's a very important point that we have to stand up and redefine uh, and explain that uh, Israel is a place, it's a culture, and we are the people of Israel. So it's a very important point. Just wanted to thank Arye and uh, thank you, Randy. carry on with your wonderful work. Thank you. So there's another, uh, Ari, maybe we'll, we'll end with a, a final question, unless uh, Toby, does, is there a question you'd like to pose? Uh, no, no particular question. Thank you, Ari. Thank you, all of you, for making such great points. And uh, speaking on behalf of one family, we understand all too well um, about how touching your feet on the ground, in particular, having a, a physical and combined spiritual experience can make all the difference. And we hope to see many of you together with us when we can all get on airplanes and go feel the land again. Very Especially good. on the on, on, one, on one family's cross Israel hike, which I hope to be able to join in October. For we, I'm day. still planning on it, still optimistic, and we look forward to having you with us. Excellent. So there's another, maybe we'll, we'll wrap up with a, a final question that was posed on uh, Facebook. Um, and again, this is a question that I think probably each of us on the screen would, would be able to weigh in on, but I'm going to ask Arie to have the final word. Uh, the question comes from Bonnie, and she asks, how can we best support Israel in these trying times? There are so many great charities. How do you know who to give to? Um, and so I'll, I'll say that I've got my ideas of uh, fantastic charity. So um, Bonnie, if you'd like to, to get my take on it, I'm happy to give my two cents at any time. Uh, you can reach out to me at zedgoodman at holyblossom.org. Um, but Aria, uh, if, you, if you'd uh, like to feel that, what are, what are some of the ways that uh, we could give to Israel at this time? Well, you know, it, it's funny. First of all, Bonnie, thank you for the question. And, and, and I want all of our listeners and viewers and all of you to know that uh, I did not plant this question, but I have a great answer, <laughs> if I could say so. Um, first of all, I, as an Israeli, um, I want to thank you, all of you, and, and all of the community who is watching, and the Jewish community and non-Jews around the world who are supportive of Israel, because I don't, and I don't think uh, any of us really take it for granted. We are always very appreciative of all the support that, uh, that we get in Israel, what, whatever form that takes. Um, but I mentioned earlier about the issue of action. Of, of the reawakening our Zionism means not just celebrating Yom Ma'ut or waving a flag, but actually getting out there. And one of the issues I already mentioned was taking action. But to put it in context, many of you may be familiar, certainly in Andrea and Irving and others at the, uh, at the uh, Anti-Semitism Educational Foundation are, and certainly those that stand with us and many of the rest of you involved in advocacy. You may be familiar with the three Ds of the new anti-Semitism that we introduced that Natan Sharansky introduced when he was Minister for Diaspora Affairs. Uh, and those three Ds uh, are, are delegitimization um, and uh, a double standard or discrimination um, and um, dehumanization. I don't want to go into details on those three Ds, but I do want to share with you that I developed about a decade ago my, my answer to the three Ds of the new anti-Semitism, the discrimination and delegitimization of Israel, which I called the four E's of the new Zionism. 
as I mentioned, that the new that 21st century Zionism is to be active in supporting and defending Israel's right to exist and right to defend itself. And the four E's that I want to share with you are engage, and that means your parliamentarians, or if you're an American Congress people, um, your uh, uh, um, leaders, other leaders that are uh, there in your community, business leaders, church leaders, trade union leaders, academics on campus, etc. Um, that's one very important step to action, engage. And the second E is embrace, to, to, to actually engage and embrace the people that you're arguing with. In other words, don't just criticize the media. Invite an editor out for lunch. Engage with him or her. Discover what, what motivates him or her, what interests him or her. Maybe, they, maybe they're an avid sports fan. And therefore, in your advocacy efforts, you can help them to understand that, for instance, 50% of the players in Israel's National Soccer League are Arabs, are Arab Muslims. An amazing uh, lens within, through which to view Israel as a multicultural uh, community without having to play the rah-rah Israel, Israel's a wonderful democracy type of, of card. So in embracing others, even those we, we argue with, I think is important. That's the second E. And the third E is, of course, educate, which all of our co-sponsoring organizations and Holly Blossom, you do. And, uh, but that means educating even informally, educating public figures and the clergy uh, and youth to some of the issues we brought up today and the others in terms of the, the reality of what is Zionism, of what it means to be a Jewish people, of uh, the defensive nature of Israel's military operations, of, of Israel's very legitimacy. Um, and the fourth E is, is encourage. And here's where you could consider that financial encouragement, financial support, or encouraging different non-government organizations like the Jaffe Institute, like One Family, like the, the Canadian uh, Anti-Semitism Educational Foundation, uh, like Stand With Us, like Holy Blossom and your, your Israel uh, uh, Engagement Committee, um, supporting your local organizations in, in whatever work they're doing and, and in ways which includes, of course, donating, but also investing, investing in Israeli companies, uh, investing in, in companies or organizations that work with, with Israel. Coming to visit Israel is a very important way to encourage Israel. Um, and, and coming here to study and the like. So those are the four E's that I would actually put as an answer to Bonnie, and I appreciate the question as a good way to close of how can we reawake our Zionism, not only by singing and praying and, and joining in these kind of discussions, uh, and not only by, uh, by being actively involved in these kind of uh, online activities, but to engage, to embrace, uh, to educate and to encourage and support and be actively involved. Um, and I thank you because by definition, if you're watching this, if you're part of this, then you are engaging and educating and embracing uh, and, and encouraging us. So thank you. And thank you, Bonnie, for the question. So Ari, thank you for your time. And Andrea and Pam and Toby and Randy, thank you so much from the Canadian uh, Anti-Semitism Education Foundation, the Jaffa Institute, the One Family Fund and Stand With Us Canada. We are so grateful for your support and your partnership to uh, make this day with REA possible. I'm gonna just share one final picture as we, uh, as we can kind of think of um, and leave a, a quintessential image of REA in your mind uh, is when I think of REA Green, I think of this picture. Um, a kind and happy and full of life character. I also believe, R.A., correct me if I'm wrong, is this the, the front cover of your book? Um, actually, it's a picture on the back of the book. It's ah, not okay. from the front cover, but yeah. So it's a picture of my what, arriving but, home in Beit Shemesh. At, so uh, a beautiful, at beautiful Shemesh. picture in, in, in our mind with the smile and your warmth. Um, and again, if you haven't had a chance to read my Israel Trail, um, go ahead and, and take, a, take a look. It's a wonderful publication. And if you'd like to learn any more about any of the sponsors that we just heard from, you could go to the event page on our Holy Blossom website. And there's links to each of their websites, uh, the Stand With Us Canada and One Family Fund, Canadian Anti-Semitism Education Foundation and the Jaffa Institute. So if you're looking for more information, please do uh, go search those uh, links that, uh, on our website. 
And uh, I'll end with saying that we know that Yom HaZikaron and Yom HaTzma'ut are just around the corner. Uh, and that if you'd like to, we we'll invite you to our live stream. Aria, you're welcome to join us. It will be quite late uh, in Israel, um, beginning at 6 p.m. on Tuesday, April 28th. We have our Yom HaZikaron ceremony. And then uh, about 6.45, uh, just as we would in Israel transition from the heaviness of Yom HaZikaron and that remembrance to the celebration of life in Yom HaTzma'ut, uh, we will transition into a conversation with David Matlow uh, about Herzl and Herzl's dream. Um, I believe we're calling it Herzl's dream, Israel, the new old land. So we can continue the conversation about Israel and the land and the people we are uh, that. so grateful to you, Aria, for being with us today. So I'll give you the last word. Thank you so much. We really <laughs> enjoyed your, uh, your uh, talk with us today. Not at all. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for hosting me and for all of our co-sponsors. I have to say David Matlow is, in fact, a friend uh, and an investor in the company that I work with, Energia Global, uh, which builds renewable energy fields in Africa, based here in Israel. So I'm delighted that you're having him on to talk about uh, Herzl, which, of course, he has that wonderful collection. He's one of the world's experts on Herzl. So I'm sure it will be both uh, scintillating, fascinating, as well as, uh, as very uplifting. Thank you all for joining me today. And again, thank you, Rabbi Zachary, for, for hosting us. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. This uh, is going to conclude our live stream. So we're so... Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach. <laughs>